One of the more difficult things when it comes to the book of Jeremiah, as I've been studying this, um, is it doesn't always tell us who's speaking. Like you go from God speaking, and then Jeremiah speaking, and you don't really know. And then you've got the Babylonians speaking. You've got different people speaking at different times. The Bible doesn't always tell us who's speaking, so you've got to sort of stop, stop and slow down. So well, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that God is saying these things. Or it doesn't make sense that Jeremiah is usually, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't seem to fit, it's usually because it has turned attention to somebody else. So even though these are the words and the writings of Jeremiah, as he's prophesying, sometimes he's prophesying uh, of things that his wicked nation are saying or, what the Babylonians are saying or, or things like this. So you've got to get used to that idea uh, as you study the book of Jeremiah. But look at verse number 30, the last verse there. It says, Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. The title for the sermon this afternoon is The Lord Hath Rejected Them. And so I know uh, usually when we think about the term rejected or reprobate, we tend to think about those that obviously um, have gotten to a point where they are so wicked, they are so full of hatred toward God, they've rejected God and God has rejected them, where they've actually lost their opportunity to be saved because they will not believe. God has darkened their hearts, God has messed with their minds and they will not come to the Lord for salvation. Now, when we talk about Jeremiah chapter 6, we're, we're dealing with a, a topic slightly different from that, okay? We're dealing with, again, the southern kingdom of Judah and that southern kingdom did come, become reprobate to God, but not in the same sense that you think about the reprobate doctrine as it were. Okay? But what we can get from this chapter is at least a, a flavor of understanding what the reprobate doctrine is. It's not a doctrine that I've preached yet in this church. It's a doctrine that I have preached up in New Life Baptist Church, but not in this church. Eventually I'll preach in this doctrine. But it gives us an idea of, of what it takes for God to say you're reprobate to me. You're rejected in my sight. And, 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 you know, as we've been going from Jeremiah chapter 1 up to, up to Jeremiah chapter 5, you see the wickedness of the nation. I mean, for God to get to the point where he says, I, I, I've rejected you, I'm done with you, a lot of wickedness has taken place. It's not like God's just quick to dismiss people. God is merciful, gives us chance after chance after chance. In fact, even within this chapter, we're going to see how God keeps calling them back, keeps calling back, come on, come back to me, get things settled before we get to that point where I have to reject you. But we start there in verse number one. O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out in the midst of Jerusalem and blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a sign of fire in Beth Hakerim, for evil appeareth out of the north and great destruction. So uh, Jeremiah is preaching to the Benjaminites. And when you know, if you know the, your history and you know the, the, you know the nation of Israel, when you, the two, uh, when you have the nation divided into two kingdoms, the southern kingdom were made up of two tribes the tribes of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah, okay? And the tribe of Benjamin was, was more north, was north, and Judah was more southern within that kingdom. And so the reason Jeremiah is one in Benjamin is because the, as the Babylonians co are coming, they're coming from the north. And so as they come through, the first tribe that they're going to hit, of course, is the tribe of Benjamin. And that's why uh, Benjamin is being spoken to here by, uh, by Jeremiah, but then he says this, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem. Okay, so Jerusalem is more southern from that, okay? So what, what's happening is here, what, what, what is being prophesied is as the tribe of Benjamin, as the Benjamites see the Babylonians coming, that they flee into Jerusalem. Because obviously Jerusalem being the major city, the capital city, that's the city with the walls, that's the city with the, with the military might. And so there's this thought that maybe if we flee into Jerusalem, that's where we're going to be safe. Okay, so that's the mindset of human beings. But then he's, you know, God is saying, look, uh, flee out of the midst of Jerusalem. It's not going to be safe in Jerusalem. Wherever you think it's going to be the safest in your land, it's still going to be overtaken. There's no chance uh, for, for the southern kingdom of Judah to get out of this uh, um, judgment that's coming out of the Babylonians. But I want you to notice toward the end of verse number one, it says, for evil appeareth out of the north, and great destruction. Let me ask you a question. Who is sending this evil? Anybody? Who's sending this evil coming from the north? God is sending this evil. Okay. Now, I remember when I was a child, I would read the Bible and I would see how God would do evil, how he would send evil. And it always like, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Because, you know, you know, you tend to think, when you think of evil, don't you normally think of sin? You know, and, and you know, yes, you know, all sin is evil, okay? But not all evil is sin. Like, if God can send evil, obviously He's not make, causing people to sin, all right? 
So when you think about the term evil, as you read through your Bible, one of the best things to help you understand and not, not see uh, or think there's some type of contradiction is understand that evil is something that is harmful. Okay? But something that is harmful is not necessarily a sin. Okay? I mean, it is harmful for a murderer to be put to death. You, you know, if we had the death penalty in Australia, someone commits murder, they're found to be guilty, that person is to be put to death, hey, that's something harmful to that person. That person is going to receive evil in the hands of a government. But that's not sin. In fact, it's righteous. It's the righteous doing to put that, some, put that wicked person uh, to death. And so you need to just understand, just in case this is something that you struggle with, to think, how can God be sending evil? Well, let's turn to Isaiah now. Keep your finger in Jeremiah. Let's go to Isaiah 45 and verse number 7. Isaiah 45, please. And verse number 7. This is a verse that gets used by Calvinists. I don't know if you're familiar with Calvinism. But generally speaking, those that are uh, sort of really invested into Calvinism, they will turn you to Isaiah 45 verse 7 for a reason. And Isaiah 45 verse 7 reads, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace, look at this, and create evil. Who's creating evil? I, the Lord, do all these things. Hey, who creates evil? God in this verse. Is this saying, oh, so the Calvinist will say, see, evil is sin. Because the Calvinist believes everything is predetermined. Whether you're going to believe on Christ or not, God's already made that decision on your behalf. And I remember having a conversation with a Calvinist. And I said, wait, wait a minute, are you saying that if I sin, that God wanted me to sin? And he's kind of like a half embarrassed look on his face. He goes, yeah. And he goes, well, look, Isaiah 45 verse 7. You know, God created evil. Yeah, but that's not, you know. So you can see if someone misunderstands what evil is and they think all evil is sin, then you, you conclude that God, I guess, wants people to sin. But of course we know. We know we've got plenty of verses, black and white, that God does not want you to sin. Okay, it's, it's trespassing against his law. And so when God is sending evil, he's not sending sin. He's causing people to be harmed. Okay, why is this nation being harmed? Again, because of their wickedness. Back to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 2. Jeremiah 6, verse 2. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to ask me after the service. Verse number two, I have likened the daughter of Zion, that's the southern kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem, to a comely and delicate woman. Okay, so Judah is a beautiful woman as far as, you know, the land is beautiful. You know, the, 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 um, the fruit, the, the fertility of the land, it's beautiful. Okay, so the, the land is being likened to this woman. Verse number three, the shepherds with their flocks shall come unto her, they shall pitch their tents against her round about. They shall feed everyone in his place. So this is one reason why the Babylonians are coming to take the land. They say, well, it's a beautiful land. Look, look, look at all the fertility. Look, look at all the great resources this land has. So the Babylonians are like, hey, we're like shepherds taking our sheep to feed there in this beautiful land. And so that's the mindset of the Babylonians. And don't forget, I mentioned this, when did I mention this? On Thursday, I think. Many times when governments go to war, They'll tell you, they'll tell you in their press conferences it's for righteous reasons. But most often than not, they've just looked at the land. Hey, that looks like a beautiful, delicate woman. Hey, there's great resources over there. We're going to take it all for us. That's, how, that's what war is a lot of the time. Okay? That's how it is. Okay? Verse number four. Now, verse number four is the Babylonians are speaking now in verse number four. So keep this in mind. Also, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Verse number four is the Babylonians speaking. Prepare ye war against her. Arise. And let us go up at noon. Woe unto us, for the day goeth away, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. Arise, and let us go by night, and let us destroy her palaces. So the Babylonians are saying, hey, at verse number four, all right, let us go at noon. So at noon they wanted to go and, and, and attack. Okay? But then they say, woe unto us, the day has gone, gone away. So as they're preparing to make war, the days go on, the hours go on. It's like, oh man, we wanted to go at noon, but the days keep going, right? Now evening's upon us. And what they're saying is, at verse 5, Arise, let us go by night to destroy. So they end up, the, the, the initial attack is at night. Now please go back to Jeremiah chapter 5, just one chapter back. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse number 6. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse number 6. And so what we learn here is that the initial attack of the Babylonians took place at night. And what I like about the Bible is just how consistent and beautiful it is. Because in chapter 5, verse number 6, you may remember this verse. 
It says, wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them. Then it says this, and a wolf of the evenings shall spoil them. And I was trying to tell you how, you know, God is using these animals as illustrative. Uh, and you have the wolf, which will attack at night. And so, you know, the Babylonians had planned to attack in the afternoon. But because of the prophecy that we have in Jeremiah, the day got long, they got behind schedule, and they ended up having to attack at night, you know, corresponding with what Jeremiah prophesied. I love the Bible like that, because it's just amazing how consistent, and you can see how God's word is always accomplished. You know, the prophecies always come true, one way or another, right? Anyway, let's go back. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 7. As a fountain casteth out her waters, so she casteth out her wickedness. This is now back to Jerusalem, back to Judea, okay? Violence and spoil is heard in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. There are two thoughts here. We have the, the nation which is full of wickedness. It's like turning on your, your, your tap in your house. You turn your tap, you expect water to come out, right? And it's like as soon as, you know, it's, it's like this fountain. It's like this tap of water. Instead of it being water, it's wickedness that's coming out of the land of Judah. And so God is looking at the wickedness and says, look, I've got to destroy this place because of its wickedness. But he also sees the cries of the downtrodden, right? It says, He violence and spoil is hurting her before me continually is grief and wounds. And of course, when people are being wounded, when people are taken, being taken advantage of, when people are being abused, generally speaking, people will yell out and cry out to God, God, why is this happening to me? Even non-believers cry to God, yes, when they're going through difficulties. And so God is seeing the wickedness, but He also hears the cries of the downtrodden. Keep your finger there. Let's go to Psalm 61. Psalm 61. And what saddens me about the state of Judah here is that it reminds me, this verse reminds me a lot of the Psalms. A lot of the Psalms are written in a very similar fashion. I'll just give you one example here in Psalm 61 and verse number 1. Psalm 61 and verse number 1 reads, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. So here we have a righteous, a believer, crying out to God. God, hear my despair, right? Verse number two. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. A lot of the Psalms are written the same way. Where the psalmist is, is being persecuted by the enemy. He cries out to God. He says, God, please hear my cry. Or God says, I hear the cry of my people. A lot of the, a lot of the psalms are like this. All right? And what saddens me about uh, Judah at this point in time, it's not the enemy that's making them to cry out. I mean, it makes sense that God's, uh, so the, 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 yeah, God's enemies are persecuting God's people. It makes sense. A lot of the psalms are like that. But then you get to, to Jeremiah... And the people are crying out, it's its own people. It's, the own, it's, 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 it's its own nation that's become the enemy of those that are crying out to God. It's amazing to me. You know, you have God's people. God, help me from my enemy. And now the enemies are within. The enemies are within the same nation. Okay? Judah had become it's, it's like its own enemies, attacking itself. And God hears that. And brethren, let me encourage you, if you're in difficulties... Okay, if you're struggling, if there's some enemy or some trial, just cry out to God. What does it mean to cry out? Remember, yell out. Use your voice. Right? So, you know, there's, it's perfectly right for you to ask God for help in a time of need. And God will deliver you. God will see you through. I mean, if, if, you've, if you've prayed prayers to the Lord, I'm sure many times you've seen answer prayers. And you know what? If you didn't cry out, it's, it's likely that prayer would not have been answered. That request wouldn't have been answered. You know, I get the question sometimes. If God knows everything that we need, why do we even have to ask for it? Well, God, that's what God sets forth, right? That we, we, we use our mouths, that we, we, we go to Him, that we ask Him for help, that, we, that He sets us in a high place and delivers, delivers us from wickedness. And brethren, I'm not even concerned about the enemies that Australia may have. There are enemies within this nation. <laughs> There are enemies within this nation and there's you know, a necessity to cry out to God. Don't forget this Thursday, if you're going to be here, that's our time to cry out to God, to pray to the Lord, to help us live that uh, uh, quiet and peaceable life, which I covered this morning. Verse number 8. Oh, it says here, Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem. So God is giving Jerusalem one more chance, another chance. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee. 
God's warning them. I'm going to depart. I'm going to, I'm going to reject you soon. Lest my soul depart from thee. Lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. We see, we see this progression to a reprobate nation. God keeps telling them time and time again, even though he sees the weakness, even though he sees uh, poor people downtrodden and taken advantage of, he still says, look, come back to me. You've got a chance. Brethren, don't play with God. Don't get far from God and think it's all good because for a long time he will be good with you. You know, you can turn your back from, to God. From, to God. You, you, you can stop reading your Bible. You can stop going to church. And I promise you, you're going to be just fine for a while. For a while. Okay, and you're going to think, well, it's fine. Hey, I've missed church. Nothing seems to be going wrong with me. Hey, I'll miss that again. I'll stop picking my Bible. Maybe God's not even around. Well, you know, how come he's not acting? Because he's begging you, come back before I depart from you. You know, before I leave you desolate. We have to, you know, God gives us opportunity after opportunity. And you know, those that become reprobate, you know, obviously a believer cannot become reprobate in that sense. But those that become reprobate, God gives them chance after chance, after chance, and God warns them, my soul's going to depart from you. You're going to be left desolate. He gives them opportunities. You know, some people struggle with this reprobate doctrine. Oh, no, God gives everybody, you know, to their final breath to believe in Him. Man, people are wicked, okay? People are wicked, and God has given them so many chances. You know, maybe, maybe you might think it's not fair, God, for you to reject someone that is so wicked, Lord. You should have given them more chance. You don't even know how many chances God gave them. God would have given them many, many chances before he ultimately rejects them. Verse number 9. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall truly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine, turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. The, the vision that I get in verse number 9 uh, I, my, my children, they love grapes. They love grapes. And when you have those beautiful, big, ripe grapes and they're on special, you know, I usually go out and buy a lot. And they, look, they look wonderful, don't they? Grapes look great. They're, 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 they're an appealing fruit on the eyes. But then, once it's in the hands of my kids, they, they strip it bare. Right? What are you left with? Just, just the, the stems. <laughs> those little stems. I mean, you compare what, what it looks like when it's left after it's all been eaten and consumed compared to what it looked like when you bought it, right? There's a huge difference. That's what God's saying. Hey, you guys looked beautiful. You, you had like, you know, like your graves, but now you're going to be stripped bare by the Babylonians. There'll be nothing left. It's going to be like that. That comparison will be like that in the city. Verse number 10. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. So, you know, I, I believe this is probably Jeremiah, all right? So he, he's speaking to people and he's saying, here, look, they're not listening to me, God. They're not listening. And, you know, you go door to door soul winning. How many times are people not listening, not interested? Do you give up? There are so many people whose ears are uncircumcised, just like here. Okay, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot hearken. They cannot hear the word of God. Now, let's keep our fingers there. Let's go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, verse 51, please. Acts chapter 7, verse number 51. Brother David's been preaching through a series in the book of Acts there. And uh, what we're looking at here is, of course, the, uh, the preaching of Stephen before he was put to death, right? And I just want to see, I want to show you the parallel here because God is saying that those of the southern kingdom that, that, that their ears are uncircumcised. What does that mean? You know, obviously we're talking about something of a spiritual nature, but what does that really mean? Well, when we turn to Acts chapter 7, verse 51, Stephen, uh, again, preaching against the Christ-rejecting Jews here, verse 51, it says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So we learn a few things there. If you're uncircumcised by the ear, which is what Judah was saying about the nation, they are also uncircumcised in the heart. Hey, what is salvation? It's the circumcision of the heart, right? That's what it is. And so when someone is uncircumcised of heart, they are, they are a non-believer, okay? Why are they uncircumcised of heart? Because they're uncircumcised of ears, okay? And the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, when you go and you preach the gospel, you're hoping to get those ears circumcised. 
That's essentially what you're trying to do. And if that ear will listen, if that ear will hearken, it will go down into their hearts and then they can believe with all their heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. But if their ears are blocked, brethren, they're not going to believe in their hearts. You know, they're not going to believe. And so when we talk about uh, what Stephen is saying there, he says, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. Referring to who? Those of Judah, right? Like your fathers were uncircumcised of ears and heart, so, so are you, all right? And uh, it t- tells us also here, it says, Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. A reproach means that you're kind of like disappointed or ashamed. And so we have many churches in Australia where pastors will not preach certain passages. They will not cover certain topics because they're ashamed of what the Bible says. They're ashamed, right? They feel like if I get out there and people know what I believe, that they're going to laugh at me, they're going to scorn Listen, brethren, we just preach the Bible. You know, again, why do I preach chapter by chapter? Is it because I'm just trying to follow some other pastor? No, because it forces you to preach the things that you otherwise would avoid. Because every every preacher has like a hobby horse. Like, you know, if if I just wanted to preach the things that I'm only interested in, you're only going to be hearing certain things all the time. But chapter by chapter forces you to cover things that you aren't, that, you know, maybe, maybe to some extent you feel a bit of reproach. Maybe some of those things, it's like, oh, God, I don't know if I really want to cover that. But you're kind of forced to, to do it. And, and, you know, don't forget that as, as a preacher, as, as members of Blessed Hope Baptist Church, please understand you're going to be hearing preaching from here, either from me or from others, that you're not going to like. Okay? You're not going to like it. But I don't want you to be like the people of Judea that were uncircumcised of ears. Okay? You've got to be willing to have your ears open. This is why quite often when we, when we pray before the sermon, people are saying, hey, Lord, open our ears. Open our hearts. Help us to understand because every sermon is going to step on someone's toes. It's just going to happen. Because we're all at different stages in our spiritual walk. Anyway, back to verse number 11. Verse number 11. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 11, sorry. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 11. Jeremiah says, Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. He says, Lord, they won't listen to me. They don't open their ears. He says, I'm weary. So, you know, I've got to keep going. And I love that about Jeremiah. Even though nobody's listening. He says, look, God, I can't stop. I've got to keep telling the message. Brethren, be that way when you go soul winning. When you've knocked 99 doors and, no, and everyone's like, not interested, not interested, not interested, not interested. Just go and knock the 100 door. <laughs> go knock 101 because there might very well be someone there that's ready to hear. Don't give up. Jeremiah doesn't give up. He says, they don't listen. It's frustrating. It's stiff-necked people. But I just can't help it. I've got to keep going. I've got to keep telling them the word of God. It says, I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband and the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. Jeremiah says, I'm, I'm going to preach to anybody that wants to listen. If it's children, I'm going to preach to the children. If it's young people, I'm going to preach to the young people. If it's families, husbands, I'm going to preach to them. If, it, if it's older people, I'm going to preach to them. Brethren, when you knock on the door of an older person, I used to think when I was out soul winning the very first time, I was looking forward to speaking to the older people. Why? Because they're close to death. I thought maybe they're thinking about eternity. What I found was the older people, okay, the generation that have gone before us, you know, what, what do you call that generation? The, ah, my parents' generation. What do they call it? Baby boomers. Baby boomers. I, I thought these people, surely they want to hear what God says. Boy, man, I can't believe it. You know who listens to God's word? The young people. The teenagers. Those in their early 20s. Those in the 30s. The ladies. You get to the older people, they don't want to hear it. They're like, oh, I already are. I've lived my life for 70, 80 years. Well, you think you're going to tell me something I don't already know? They've hardened their hearts against the Lord. And it's amazing to me because people say, hey, where are all the young people in church? I tell you where the young people are. Their parents, the previous generations, did not teach them what the Bible says. That's why it's so important, brethren. And I tell again, the Friday night guys, I tell you, don't just tell people what is right and wrong. Show them from God's word. You know, young people actually want to know what God has to say. Young people know there's something wrong with what is being taught in their schools. Young people have a hole in their hearts and want to, want to fill that with the Lord Jesus Christ. But they don't know. They don't have the answers. Many times the older people just won't listen. But hey, even if they don't listen, when you knock on an older person's door, just be like Jeremiah. Well, I'll preach to you as well. I'll, if I get children, I'll preach to children. Young people, I'll preach to young, pe- pe- children, young, young people. Families, families. Older people, older people. You preach to all of them. I've been surprised. I, you know, again, you knock many times on, older, on the Sunshine Coast. 
There's an area where it's, it's just mostly retired people, just an older generation. And I kind of dread going there. But brethren, there's always a salvation out there somewhere. You know, it always encourages me. I better keep going because there's always someone. I'm not going to give up in this area. You know? And what I like about this passage as well is this is another reason why, as a church, we're a family-integrated church. It's not like we have a lack of rooms. It's not like if we had more space, when the preaching starts, we're going to put the kids into their own little class. Jeremiah is preaching to them all. doesn't matter how young, old. They need to hear God's word. All right? Now, parents, in, in your house, you know, with your children, you can teach them and teach them slightly differently. You do whatever you want in your own house. You're responsible for that. But when it comes to the house of God, it's so important that we don't think our children cannot listen. In fact, that's probably what's gone wrong with our generation. That's probably what's gone wrong. Generations of church-going people, uh, the preaching's too complicated for my kids. We better send them down to the dumb-down Sunday school weekend. They can dance and eat, eat, cat, eat lollies all day. And then they grow up. No wonder they're not interested in church. Because that's what they thought church was. Just dancing around and eating lollies. And that's what the Hillsong, that's what the Hillsong offers, right? So they go to the Hillsong church. They go to those churches because they, they don't know what church was like. It's important for our children to be here. You know, our children will pick up things that you may not pick up. You know, things that actually affect, uh, have, a, have a benefit in their life as they grow up and, and, you know, into adulthood. Verse number 12. And their houses shall be turned unto others, and their fields and wives together. They're going to lose it all. Even family is going to be torn apart. For I will stretch out mine hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. What a judgment to come. What a judgment. I think, I think the thing that will hurt me the most is me losing my family. You know, being torn apart from my children, my children being taken away from me or something like that. I think that would be the, probably the biggest hurt that I could possibly have. That, that judgment was going to fall upon these people. Verse number 13. For from the least of them unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. That's Australia. <laughs> and from the prophet even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Hey, all the religious leaders, again, Friday night, we'll talk about this, right? Many religious leaders deal falsely, okay? They might say one thing and live a different way. They, they might say they, they love the Lord. They might say they, they love uh, teaching people the Word of God, but really they're doing it for money. They're doing it for, for I don't know, you know for, for fame. They're doing it for other reasons. They're doing it to please man, you know? And the, the religious leaders of this day, brethren, they were dealing falsely with the people. How were they dealing falsely? Verse number 14. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. So Jeremiah, remember, Jeremiah's preaching fire. He's consuming the people. People are getting burnt. People are getting burnt and they're going to the priests and, and, and their, uh, and their uh, prophets and saying, hey, Jeremiah's preached some powerful sermons lately. Is it true? Well, they, these prophets, they're trying to heal them, right? It says it, right? They have healed also the hurts. Hey, it seems nice. To, I would rather be healed than hurt, right? I'd rather go to a church which I'm, I'm, I'm going to feel good about. I'm not going to get burned. So that's what's going on. And what are they saying to the people? Uh, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Brethren, God is angry at the wicked every day. Every day. Just because you're saved, don't think you're going to get away with your sins. God will judge you. God will bring his judgment upon you. Get right with God. Go and confess your sins before God. You need to hear this. You need to hear the God of the Bible. I know preaching for Jeremiah can feel a bit negative. You know? But listen, the other preachers are just saying, peace, peace, it's all fine. When there is no peace, they're lying to you. When they don't tell you about the judgment of God, they're lying to you, brethren. Joyce Meyer, what's her book? God is not, God is not mad at you. Joyce Meyer, that, that female preacher, she has literally thousands of followers in her church and online. God is not mad at you. Just up, oh, heal. Oh, did you hear Pastor Kevin preach? Are you a little bit burnt? Come over here. Come to Joyce Meyer's ministries. We'll heal it up. Peace, peace, they'll say to you. There is no peace, brethren. When you're sinning against the Lord, when our nation has turned toward weakness against the things of God, expect judgment to fall upon us. This coronavirus may very well be judgment. I don't know. Fires may very well be judgment. I don't, I don't always know exactly what they are, brethren. But I don't expect happy days in the future. It's so important that we prepare our children to understand. I don't know if things are going to get back to the way they were. I have no idea. I hope it does. I don't know. 
Okay, but our, our children need to prepare themselves spiritually to understand they're going to grow up in a wicked world. Wicked world. And they need to stand up. They need to be like Jeremiah, you know, in this day and age. Verse number 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. And so the nation's doing a whole bunch of wickedness. There is no shame. No shame. Um, you know, I, I, I hear stories of the past where, let's say, a, a woman fell pregnant outside of marriage. It would be a shame. Like they'd try to cover that up. They'd try to make it a secret so, you know, it doesn't destroy the name of the whole family. Is that the issue today? There is no shame today. They don't blush today, right? People are committing all kinds of sins in this world today. There is no shame. There is no blushing. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This is the, the, the road of the reprobate, you know. They commit sin and they get to a point where I don't care anymore. I'm not ashamed anymore. I'm not ashamed for what I'm doing. And you start searing your conscience. Well, you, not even your conscience bothers you. You know, in the past, your conscience bothered you about something and you listened to your conscience and that was kind of keeping you accountable in your actions. But you get to a point where you just commit so much filth, you know, and you don't, you're not ashamed of it. Your conscience gets seared against the Word of God. And you no longer think there's a problem. Okay? What were they committing? They were committing spiritual, spiritual adulteries. They were worshipping false gods. They were committing physical adulteries and fornication. They were murdering the innocents. No shame. No shame. Same thing going on in Australia. There's no shame in this land. Verse number 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. God's telling them again, walk in the old ways. Come back. The reprobate gets opportunity after opportunity. The old ways. You know, if you've seen the signage at the top of the building, it says Independent Fundamental Baptist. Hey, are there some bad Independent Fundamental Baptist churches out there? Of course there are. Are there some bad pastors out there? Of course there are bad pastors. But I love those words, independent. Why? Because we're accountable to God. Not to some pope, all right? Not to some denominational headquarters. Fundamental. Why are we fundamental? Because we hold to the fundamentals of the faith. The Trinity is a fundamental doctrine. We hold to the fundamentals, the foundations of the Christian faith. We're not going to change those beliefs. Baptists, well, I think only the Baptists baptize properly. But listen, brethren, the reason I have those words, when people see those words, I want them to think, this is going to be a traditional church where people still sing the old hymns, where people still read from the old King James Bible, yeah. where people are still preaching the old doctrines that were being pre preached generations before and they're not changing it. Amen. We're going to follow after the old ways, brethren. We start changing things up. I like this old looking pulpit even. Good on you, brother. <laughs> we could have had a fancy clear plastic one that gets knocked over too easy. I like this. It's, it feels old-fashioned. I like it. Okay? I like it. We're, we're going to stick to the old ways. If we start thinking we need to follow new paths, brethren, it leads us to the way, you know, the religious leaders of Judah were like at, this, at that point in time. Man, you want to grow this church? We can change the music if you want. We can grow this church. We can grow this church. Trust me. We just first get, off, get off the King James Bible. That's one thing we can do. Start changing the hymns into your modern songs that have no depth in it. That sounds like you're singing to a girlfriend rather than singing to God. We can grow a church that way. But then we're just going to end up in corruption. Yeah. We're going to end up corrupting. I don't want to be in a church. You, you, you already travel. Some people travel far to be in church. You sit for an hour, an hour and a half or more. I mean, and then could you imagine your worship just means nothing to God? What a, what a waste of time. You might as well just go play soccer or something. <laughs> That's more beneficial. You might as well just, just do anything. Watch TV would be more beneficial than being in some of those churches. I want to make sure when we come to church, it's giving God glory. You know, that God is speaking to us through His Word by the Holy Spirit. That's where value is in the old ways, brethren. We need to keep this way. 
one day I'm not going to be the pastor. I want this church to continue to the day Christ comes back. One day I'm going to get too old, you know, and someone else is going to be the pastor or someone else, whatever, something throughout life, you know, and we need to make sure we keep the same course, that we don't change things around, all right? Ideas are great. New ideas are great. Hey, live streaming, that's kind of new, but that's great. But we're not going to change the function, okay? Live streaming, internet ministry, that's not our priority. The priority is the congregation being gathered together, hearing the word of God. Verse number 18. Oh, wait, verse number 17. He says, Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. So God says, you know, Hey, um, in verse number 16, walk therein, and they said, we will not walk therein. God says, I'm sending watchmen, trumpets. Brethren, you get up to preach behind this pulpit, you know what you need to sound like? A trumpet! You need to sound loud! Be a trumpet! You know? That's what you need. God says, look, I'm sending watchmen. I'm sending uh, 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 these people over you. And as a watchman, we're going out there, brethren. We're getting out there and uh, preaching the gospel. We're telling people about the coming judgment of God. Hey, be that trumpet that God can blow through, right? Be that vessel that God can use. Verse number 18. Therefore hear ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people. There it is, bringing evil again. Even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law. But look at this, notice the next words. But rejected it. What's the title for the sermon this afternoon? The Lord hath rejected them. But I want you to notice something with a reprobate. God only rejects those that reject Him. That's how it starts. Okay? Calvinism teaches that God has rejected most people in this world. In fact, the vast majority, like 98, 99% of people. God has rejected them uh, for no reason whatsoever. And God has accepted you already before you even had a choice whether you were going to believe the gospel or not. That's not how it works. God only rejects those that first reject Him and His Word. Okay? They had the law of God. They knew the laws of God and said, nope, we don't want it. And God then says, well, then I don't want you. Okay? Verse number 20. To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba and the sweet cane from a far country? So listen, they were still doing the religious practices. They were still burning the incense. Incense. Look, your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifice is sweet unto me. So even though they're worshipping all these false gods, they're still going to church. They're still bringing their sacrifices. They're still offering the incense. It's coming from a far country. They've said, hey, we need the best. Let's get the best. They've gone far to get the best. And God says, it's not acceptable unto me. What is this telling us? This is telling us that you can get into a place with God where you're in church, where you're, where you're singing the hymns, all right? But your heart is far from God. Your heart is on other things. And again, that's a waste of time. Listen, your heart may very well be on other things right now. Let me just encourage you, brethren, just right now, just say, God, I'm sorry. Help me focus on your word. You know, I don't, I don't want to be far from you. I want my sacrifice to be accepted by you, God. It is sacrifice to come to church. It is sacrifice to sing praises to him. It is sacrifice to give to the work of God. It requires something from us. And we want it to be acceptable to God, don't we? We don't just waste our time in church. You know, always, when you come to church, just set your heart right with God. Pray before, you know, in your driving in your family, in the car. Hey, kids, wife, let's pray. You know, as maybe you don't pray because you're driving. Maybe get your wife to pray something. And, and just ask God to bless you. Ask God to, 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 uh, to uh, you know, allow church to be a blessing to you, where you can learn certain things. And if you have any sins, just confess them to God right there and then. Come to church and be accepted of God. Verse number 21. Actually, I want to quickly read to you just the famous words of Samuel. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, I'll just read it to you. He says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken, and to hearken, that's to listen, than the fat of rams. Before you offer your sacrifices, God wants you to be obedient. God wants you to be listening to his word and following after his ways. Okay? Then you can come and bring your sacrifices. Then you can come and honor God you know, with your presence in church. But always remember, God wants your obedience. You know, you might be the biggest giver in church. You might be putting in the, the thousands of dollars into church, but you're living a life that doesn't obey God. He's not going to accept your sacrifice. You know, it's, it's so important we get the priorities right. We need to be obedient to our Lord God. Verse number 21. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before these people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them, the neighbor and his friend shall perish. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people coming from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses, set in array as men for war against thee, O daughter of Zion. God's warning them about the power of the Babylonians. They're coming from the north country. They're coming to get you. God's warning them about the coming judgment. That's what a preacher does. Warns you about the judgment of God. It's not nice to think about how God can chastise even his own people, but he does. But you know what? He does it as a loving father. When, when you parents, when you chastise your kids, you do it for their profit, don't you? You do it for their benefit. You do it so they can learn their lesson. You do it so they can be obedient to the, to the commandments that mum and dad have laid down. You do it because you want them to grow up to be somebody that is respected and not just constantly rebellious about with every person they, they come across. You know, well, God uses his chastisement for our good. You know, instead of becoming rebellious when God chastises us, just, just learn the lesson, brethren, and say, God, help me, mold me, make me into what you want me to be. Now, verse number 24, it says, We have heard... Is that what I'm up to, brethren? Yep, verse number 24. We have heard the fame thereof. Our hands wax feeble. Anguish have taken hold of us and pain as a woman in travail. So they're finally starting to realize what's going on and they're starting to get us scared. They're starting to fear. They're starting to tremble. They're starting to feel the pains like a woman who's about to give birth. One of, the, one of the themes of the book of Jeremiah is about this woman in travail. If you can please go back to Jeremiah chapter 4. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse number 31. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse number 31. The Bible reads, For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth her first child. You may remember me preaching through this. The voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. And so go back to Jeremiah chapter 6. I just want to show you that you're going to find, as we go through the book of Jeremiah, I'm not going to give you the reason why the woman in travail is always mentioned. There is something I do want to cover that's very important. Um, and, but this is a major theme. This is a major theme in the book of Jeremiah. You'll notice it again and again and again, chapters after chapter after chapter, this woman in travail, referring to, of course, Judah and the troubles, the difficulties that they're going to face as the Babylonians take over them. But just take a mental note of that every time we read about it, and I'm going to give you the explanation of all of that in Jeremiah chapter 30 when we get there. So it's still a little while away. Let's keep going. Verse number 25. Go not forth into the field, nor walk in by the way, for the sword of the enemy and fear is on every side. They're not even free to live their lives now. They're not free to just get out there because the enemy is on every side. O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning as for an only son. Most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. Again, God is calling them once again. Get right with God. The destruction's coming. Get right with God. How many times do we see God calling them? How many times? Even after God recognizes you're rejecting me, you're rejecting my laws. God's still giving them opportunity after opportunity. Brethren, the reprobate, the reprobate has been given opportunity after opportunity. They've disgraced God time and time and time again. And God has given them an opportunity again and again at some points. That line's crossed with God. We see, we see the process here, you know, how this nation became reprobate in God's eyes. Verse number 27. I have set, now God is speaking to Jeremiah here. I have set thee, so the singular, right? So to Jeremiah, I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and try their way. Boy, that's what I want for Blessed Hope Baptist Church. You know, even though this nation is just getting more wicked, I would love God to look down at this church and say, man, I've got a tower, I've got a fortress right there in Sydney. It's Blessed Hope Baptist Church. Amen. Wouldn't you want that? God say that about us. God say that about you. Yeah, absolutely, you know. So, hey, you know what? Everyone's getting scared, fearful. And this is what you need to remember. When the trials come, difficulties come, and the fears come, you can give in to the fear. That's not what God wants from you. 
God wants you to stand strong. God wants you to be that strong tower. You know, you, God wants you to have spiritual strength, you know, to go through the trials that come our way. Verse number 28. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. So God is looking at the nation and he sees that the people are like brass and iron. They're like metals, right? And then it says, for they are all corruptors. Well, brass and iron are metals that can corrode. What's a metal that cannot corrode? Anybody know? Gold. Sorry? Gold. gold. Gold is one. There is another metal that's mentioned in this chapter. We kind of covered it. What's the other one? Sorry. Someone said it. Silver. Silver. Silver is another metal that cannot corrode, right? And so God is seeing the people of the land, like brass and iron, you know, uh, you know maybe it's, it can rust or it can just corrode away, right? And then it says here in verse number 29, the bellows, the bellows are burned. What are bellows? That's when, when you're when trying to heat something up and you've got that instrument that blows air to, to, to increase the, the heat and the wind. The bellows are burned. The lead, there's another metal. The lead is consumed of the fire. Lead is another metal that can corrode. So what is this speaking about? This is speaking in language of like a miner. You know, if you want the precious metal, if you want the silver and the gold, you've got to dig in, right? And, and when you find uh, some of it, it's, all, it's always attached you know, to other metals, you know, lesser valuable metals, okay? And, uh, and when you want, you, so you say, look, I just want the precious metal, I just want the silver. Well, you've got to heat it up, all right? This is where you get your refiners from. You, you, you put that under great stress, under great heat, and under that heat, the metal starts to separate, right? And, and then the metal that separates, you don't want that metal because it's worthless. You always want the precious. You always want the silver. You want the gold. You want that which doesn't corrode. You want that which is valuable. And so this is the language that's being used here. All right? The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. You know what he's saying? This guy is working hard. He's working with all these metals. He's looking for the silver. He's looking for the gold. He's working away, but it's all in vain because the entire nation has turned against God. The entire nation has become wicked. He says, I can't find the silver. I can't find the precious metal. Verse number 30. Reprobate silver shall men call them. Reprobate. Rejected. Because the Lord hath rejected them. So we learn the definition of reprobate in this verse. Reprobate means rejected. Rejected. And so when you're, when you're refining, you're trying to get that precious metal, all the, the leftover, all the dross, all, all the, 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 the metals that are low in value, hey, they get rejected. They're worthless in comparison to what is valuable. And so what do we learn here? Of course, Jeremiah was silver. Jeremiah was gold, right? Jer Jeremiah and, and other prophets, there were other people on the land. But by and large, brethren, the nation had become corrupt. And brethren, we may very, very well find Sydney, Australia, under the fires of God, under the trials, under God's judgment. I believe it's coming. I just don't know when. I feel like sometimes maybe we're already there. <laughs> like maybe we're in the early stages and God is just warning us time and time again, right? And, he, and you know, God's put us under the fire. God's putting this nation under the fire. Brethren, I would love for God to just say, hey man, there's this, I found it. Blessed up Baptist Church. There's the gold. There's the silver. Hey, I've rejected the rest of it. Hey, but my people are still here. My people are still that strong tower. And brethren, this is what I want to leave you with. You know, what kind of Christian are you? What kind of Christian are you right now, today? When you go through stress, do you panic? Do you lose faith in God? You know, when you go through trials, do you, do you, do you give up on God? You know, when people go, a lot of people go through trials as Christians. You know, one, one of the first things they stop doing when they go through trials? They stop reading the Bible, they stop going to church. So many do this. But that's where they need to be the most. Opening God's Word is what they need to be doing the most. Coming to church and hearing God's Word is what they need to be doing the most. Brethren, you know, we don't want to be like that reprobate silver that just is worthless during the times of difficulties. You know, during the trials, during the fires, hey, during COVID-19 restrictions, during whatever challenges we may face, brethren, we should desire to come out like silver, come out like gold, be valuable in the hands of God. So brethren, what kind of Christian are you? You know, in Job 23 verse 10, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read a very short passage there. We know Job, we know how much he suffered. He suffered much more than I've ever suffered. He suffered much more than you've ever suffered, Job, right? And in Job 23 verse 10, he says, But he knoweth the way that I take. 
when he have tried me, I shall have come forth as gold. You know, Job was so sure, I've gone through so much loss, but I know when I stand before God, when I get through all this, I'm going to be like gold. I'm going to be a precious metal. You know, I'm not going to be a reprobate silver. I'm not going to be reprobate metals like brass or, or whatever, lead and iron that was covered there. Brethren, please consider these things. How do you respond in difficulties when you're under stress? Do you run to God for strength or do you run away from God? I don't want you running away from God. I don't want you rejecting God. I don't want you rejecting His Word. All right? Because judgment's going to fall upon you. And look, as a believer, as I said, you're still going to face the judgment of God. But you know what? Unfortunately, there are those in our world who know God. They know His laws. They don't blush anymore in their wickedness. Their conscience have been seared. God's warned them time and time again, come before I leave. They reject God, and God says, I've rejected you. You are reprobate. That's for the non-believer. Okay? This is a scary thing for them. And they will never have an opportunity to call upon the Lord and be saved. They cannot believe. Their conscience has been seared. And so we see here in Jeremiah chapter 6, you know, the, uh, I guess the foundational um, understanding of what is ultimately the reprobate doctrine. I might have to preach on the reprobate doctrine now that I think about it, which should tie in very well with what's here. All right, let's pray.